All right, let's see what's for lunch. Oh no, I packed a microwave by accident instead of the food. Curse this autism of mine. All right, so if you've hung around the electronics tinkering side of YouTube at all, you've probably seen this before. This is the magnetron from a microwave oven, which can transmit around 1000 watts at 2400 megahertz or 2.4 gigahertz. This thing can be used to ionize gases to plasma from a distance, heat up anything with water in it, and a bunch of other weird and possibly dangerous things. If you've seen a magnetron setup before, it probably looks something like this, using the same components it was packaged into the microwave oven with, a high voltage transformer and a diode and capacitor to serve as a rectifier and a voltage shoveler. And while this certainly works, it's heavy, bulky, and needs to be connected to mains power to run. Also, the output of the high voltage transformer is lethal because it can provide so much current even at over 2000 volts. So I really want a way to make this device portable and lightweight. Sure, in theory you could run all of this equipment off a big 60 hertz inverter powered by a car battery or something, but that's not exactly practical. If I'm hiking out in the woods and I need a 2.4 gigahertz transmitter to start a campfire or cook my food, that's way too much stuff to carry. So after doing a little bit of sciencing to characterize the behavior of the average domestic magnetron, I figured out how to make one run off a small 12 volt lithium battery, like the kind you'd use for an RC plane. But before I explain that, I probably need to give some background on how a magnetron actually works. Despite the boxy metal appearance, this thing is actually a vacuum tube, and a pretty simple one at that. The simplest vacuum tube is just a diode. The cathode is heated with a low voltage, high current power supply, and gets hot enough to boil off electrons which are negatively charged. When the anode has a voltage applied to it that's higher than the cathode voltage, the negatively charged electrons will be attracted to the positively charged anode and current will flow. However, if the anode voltage is equal to or lower than the cathode voltage, current won't flow because the similar charges will repel each other. Thus, we have a diode. Of course, in a typical circuit, we show current as flowing from higher voltage to lower voltage with the arrow of the diode pointing toward the low voltage side. This convention is used for convenience, but the distinction actually matters for vacuum tubes. The vacuum tube diode would look like this on a schematic. Okay, but what if we want to turn this into a switch? This is where the so-called triode comes in. In the triode, the anode always has some positive voltage on it, but there is a metal grid between the cathode and the anode. If the grid has the same voltage as the cathode, which is basically ground potential, the repulsion will stop the electrons from flowing. But, if a positive voltage is applied to the grid, it will attract the negative electrons, most of which will fly through the openings of the grid and hit the anode. Now we have a switch and or amplifier. Now around the same time this was developed, this guy Albert Hull was trying to sell a similar product but ran into patent infringement issues with the triode, so he started looking for an alternative way to control electron flow inside a vacuum tube. He realized that instead of an electric field, he could just use a magnetic field to control electron flow. Let's make the electrodes concentric and put the cathode in the middle. Like before, if we heat up the cathode and have some positive voltage on the anode, the electrons jump across and current flows. But now let's put a magnet above and below the electrode so that a magnetic field is running perpendicular to their axis. Now, when the electron tries to jump across, its path is bent by the magnetic field and it takes a spiral path. The stronger the magnetic field is, the more spiral turns the electron will make before it gets to the anode. However, above a certain critical magnetic field, the flight path of the electron will be bent so much that it falls back into the cathode and never reaches the anode, so no current flows. So if we replace these permanent magnets with coils, we've got electromagnets, which we can use to control the magnetic field and turn the current flow on and off. And this was the original magnetron. So that was the original intent of the magnetron, but engineers quickly realized it had another property. The swirling electrons are moving so fast that there's a ton of electromagnetic induction that happens as they move near the anode, just like an electromagnet coil with alternating current on it. So by modifying the geometry of the anode a little bit, we can cause it to have some inductance and capacitance. The inductance is caused by the bent shape of these cavities, which acts sort of like a loop of wire in an electromagnet coil. The capacitance is caused by the somewhat parallel fins being close to each other. Of course, both the capacitance and inductance are extremely small, on the order of picofarads and picohenries depending on the cavity geometry. Nevertheless, it still has a resonant frequency, and in the case of a microwave oven, it's about 2.45 gigahertz. Okay, so that's how a magnetron works. Here's how it's wired up in the microwave oven. The high voltage transformer takes in mains voltage and has two outputs. One output puts out around 3 volts at 10 amps or so to heat the magnetron filament. The other output is where the real juice comes from, and it provides over 2000 volts for the magnetron anode. The magnetron actually needs DC for the anode, so we've got this capacitor and diode here, which both rectifies and doubles the voltage from the transformer, bumping it up past 4000 volts. The caveat here is that because there's only one diode and not a full bridge rectifier, the output is only for a half cycle of the sine wave. 
What this means is the magnetron is only radiating half the time when it's powered on, and this is also part of the reason you hear a distinct hum of the mains frequency when you run your microwave. I should also point out that the high voltage of the magnetron is actually thousands of volts below ground. So the cathode might be, say, minus 4,000 volts, plus or minus 3 volts for the filament heating, and the anode is connected to ground, and the case of the magnetron, and the microwave oven. Let's take a look at this in action. Here's the magnetron wired up the same as it is inside the microwave. When I plug it in, the transformer pulls nearly 13 amps, and the effects are immediately obvious. I should point out that at these power levels, you probably want to have some sort of metal shielding around yourself and your electronics. In fact, I managed to break a wireless keyboard by doing this. Let's see how the magnetron behaves at lower power. Here I've replaced the 1 microfarad capacitor with 44 nanofarads of the capacitance and a 30 mega ohm bleed resistor so that the caps will discharge after power is removed. For a given frequency of AC, a smaller capacitor causes a higher impedance, so the 44 nanofarad cap should theoretically knock the magnetron down to 4.4% of its original power, assuming all other factors are equal. It definitely still lights the bulb, but it has to be quite a bit closer. The transformer current draw has gone down from almost 13 amps to just 9 amps. Seems like it should be less, but I think a lot of that is just going back into the grid and not being burned up. Let's try with 10 nanofarads, which should theoretically be 1% power. Here, even with the shroud removed, the light bulb doesn't turn on until it's within about half an inch of the antenna. At this power level, the transformer is still pulling 8.8 .8 amps. In fact, totally disconnected, the transformer still pulls a little over 8 amps. So yeah, a lot of that has to just be going back into the grid. Here I've attached a 51 to 1 voltage divider to the anode using 5 mega ohms and 100 kilo ohms. Let's see what the waveform looks like on the anode. We seem to bottom out at minus 42.4 volts, which multiplies out to minus 2160 volts, which is a bit lower than I expected. Let's put the original 1 microfarad capacitor back on and compare the waveform at full power. Voltage bottoms out at the same level, but at full power seems to be a relatively clean square wave. Comparing to our lower power test, I think these flat lines are where the magnetron is actually transmitting, and some effect of the device clamps any excess voltage beyond that 2200 or so. I attached a 100 ohm resistor between the rectifier diode and ground, and measured the voltage to figure out what the current was. Here we peak at minus 26 volts, which translates to 0.26 amps. Now here's what the diode current looks like when there's no filament to heat the magnetron. Notice that the peaks are dramatically smaller, probably because there's not much to sink the current through with the filament being cold. Now here's voltage in purple and current in yellow. Finally, here's the voltage without any load at all on the transformer. I still have my 51 to 1 voltage divider, which means these voltage peaks multiply out to approximately plus or minus 1700, which is actually quite a bit lower than the figure of about 2000 you usually hear for microwave transformers. Alright, now that we have some picture of how the anode voltage of the magnetron behaves, let's reconfigure things a little bit so that the high voltage is actually above ground and will be applied to the case, an anode of the magnetron. What this will allow me to do is power the filament from a bench supply to figure out the optimal current and voltage. I'm not using the one microfarad capacitor because with the case of the magnetron attached to high voltage, the risk of electric shock is very high and I don't want to risk electrocution, so I'm only using 160 nanofarads at capacitance to reduce the output power here. I've got my filament hooked up to the bench supply, so let's see what happens. As the filament heats up, we start to get a flicker from the output, but not much more than that. It turns out the magnetron is pretty sensitive to the filament current, and if it's too high or low, it doesn't work quite right. In my case, around 7 to 7.2 amps seem to be the region where the magnetron would run smoothly. Alright, time to be dangerous and attach the original 1 microfarad cap again. I found that this actually required less filament current to run smoothly than with the lower power output and seemed to work well between 5.5 to 6 amps. So now that we've got some idea of the voltages and currents needed to make the magnetron work, let's try and run it off a DC supply. To do this, I've wound a bobbin with 900 turns of 32 gauge wire to make the high voltage side of a transformer. Then I made the ZVS oscillator circuit to drive the primary coil at around 40 kHz. Here's the driver and transformer set up for a quick test. Seems to work alright. Let's see what the bench supply is doing. Okay, that current draw looks pretty reasonable. Next, I set up a voltage doubler on the output of the transformer, but I was a little worried from earlier tests that the voltage might be too low, so I added two stages instead of one. Then I hooked up the output to a 100 to 1 voltage divider to measure it with my multimeter. It gives me minus 35.7 or minus 3570 volts, which should be plenty to operate the magnetron. 
My scope paints a slightly different picture, showing the average somewhere around 5,000 volts. Note that I connected this backward to show it at positive, but the voltage is actually below ground. Okay, I've got enough voltage for the magnetron anode, so now I need to add another winding to provide the high current needed for the filament heater. I do this with two turns around the transformer core. Here I've got four 1 ohm resistors in parallel to form a 0.25 ohm load to test the filament winding, which should reasonably simulate the filament in the magnetron. The scope shows a peak of 2.32 volts across the resistive load, which means 9.3 amps peak. The RMS value of current then comes out to about 6.6 .6 amps, which should be enough to run the magnetron based on the earlier tests I did with the bench supply. However, after making numerous attempts to poke at it, I couldn't get the magnetron to light up a bulb. I didn't have a good way to fine tune the current coming from the filament winding, so I built a separate buck converter to power the filament to figure out what the optimal current was when the anode was running off my high frequency transformer. So now I've got my buck converter feeding the cathode heater of the magnetron and the flyback circuit powering the anode. This is on a plastic box to help keep it isolated from the ground since the case is being raised to a high voltage rather than the filament. I also have about 160 picofarads in series with the transformer output to limit the power. I turn on power to the buck converter and adjust it until I get just shy of 3 volts DC. Here's a look at the bench supply while I'm doing that. Right now the flyback driver is off. So now, when I tap the flyback driver positively to 12 volts with the filament being hot, the magnetron lights up the bulb. Perfect. You can clearly see the jump in current when the ZVS driver is energized. I'm simply tapping the 12 volt lead to the power supply to turn it on and off. So I've officially managed to run the whole magnetron entirely off a 12 volt DC source. Let's see what it can light up. I've got an argon tube, a neon tube, and a low pressure argon flask that will light up really easily with my battery powered Tesla coil, so in theory they should also light up from the magnetron. It lights up the small argon tube, but it has to be pretty close. With a big flask full of argon, nothing happens. Oh well. Anyway, the thing is running off 12 volts DC, but the only thing I need to figure out is why the filament winding on my transformer won't properly heat the cathode. I spent an hour or two tinkering around with different ways to make the filament winding until I finally realized the issue was due to the AC impedance of the filament itself. When I hooked the filament up to my inductor tester and my scope and then rang it, the resultant frequency indicated an inductance equivalent to about 2.8 microhenry. Now that might not sound like much, but at 40 kilohertz, it would cause about 0.7 ohms of impedance, which is more than twice the resistance of the filament itself. To correct this, I placed seven microfarads at capacitance in series with the filament winding of my transformer, which got the magnetron to work properly just off the transformer so I could ditch the butt converter. Now I just need some sort of container, preferably metal. This Care Bears lunchbox seems to fit the bill. I drilled a hole in the side for the magnetron antenna and it fits perfectly. Then I fasten it in place with some number 4 screws. Next I place my transformer and ZVS driver, then a little fence where the battery will live. Then I add a switch and an LED and all the high voltage stuff. I don't want the voltage doubler or current limiting caps shorting out across the filament caps, so I 3D printed a little deck to go over them. Everything is secured in place with silicon caulk. It seems like an odd choice, but it bonds to practically any surface, and its stretchiness means that it won't crack from thermal stresses and vibration and so forth. Turns out it's actually really good for stuff just like this. I also added this 15 amp fuse to make sure nothing crazy happened if there was a short circuit. The combination of fire from a lithium battery, high voltage, and microwave emission probably wouldn't be very pleasant. Okay, let's close it up. Oh yeah, one last thing. You know that little pink ring around the antenna? Sometimes it's white too. That's beryllium, and the dust is pretty toxic if you crush it or scratch it, so I'm just going to put this little printed sleeve over it to avoid any accidental scratches. And there we go, a microwave and a lunchbox. I also tried making a waveguide to focus the microwaves into a beam, but before it got too far, my transformer decided to short circuit and burn out, so I think I'll stop it there for now and leave the waveguide project for another time. So anyway, that's how to power a magnetron from a 12 volt battery. If you want to try this yourself, I've posted a link to the schematic in the video description. Just be aware that while microwaves aren't ionizing radiation like x-rays, repeated or long-term exposure to high power levels can cause health problems because they're still able to heat the cells in your body. In fact, it's speculated that the mysterious illness called Havana Syndrome was caused by bombardment of US and Canadian diplomats with microwaves. However, that's not confirmed, and another plausible theory is exposure to high amplitude infrasound, which I might do a video on in the future. Anyway, as long as you've prepared accordingly for the hazards of microwave radiation, this device is actually pretty easy to increase the power on by simply using a larger value capacitor in series with the voltage doubler to reduce the input impedance. Now please excuse me while I replace all the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth devices in my house.